Hey students, Instructor McCullough here. I'm going to take the moment to go over burn injuries. As always, make sure you use this in conjunction with the textbook and lecture resources provided to you by the senior or the lead instructor within the class. If you have any questions, you can feel free to either email me or one of the instructors and we'll get back to you as soon as possible. The good thing about this podcast is that you can use this as a study tool. We'll be sending you not only the link to this video that you can watch, but uh, you'll be able to download it as an MP3 and listen to it on the way to school or back from school or whenever you got some downtime. And you'll also be sent the, this PDF that I am using to uh, conduct this uh, podcast. So let's get started. First thing I want to do is go over the standards I plan to accomplish. Some of these are going to be accomplished in class during your lecture, but so far we're going to go over um, the concept that burns are not just skin deep. We're going to be able to classify burns by depth and BSA, body surface area, involved for adult patients. And we're going to discuss the considerations for, of burn depth, location, BSA, age, and medical conditions in determining the severity of burn injuries. And for our Tennessee EMTIV licensure, we're going to discuss fluid resuscitation guidelines using the Parkland burn formula. This is the stuff you're going to need out in the field after you've established an IV. So by the time you get done, you're going to be able to walk up to a patient, identify their depth, identify the location of that burn, and be able to determine the patient's body surface area that is affected, and use their age and medical conditions in determining just how severe these burn injuries are so you know where you need they need to be transported to. So I'll put transport. Excellent. Let's move on. Whenever you see a burn victim, the first thing you recognize is depth of that burn. You may not have realized that that's what you were looking at, but that's essentially what you're seeing. You're seeing the patient's depth of burning, or the depth of their burn injury. The way we know that is by their signs and symptoms. We have a superficial, partial thickness, and full thickness. Those are the three um, categories that we use to classify burn depth. In fact, some of you may have known this as first degree, second degree, and third degree. There is a fourth degree, but we really don't go into it because at that point, the patient has deceased. At this point, the patient can be resuscitated, and that's usually when we come into play. A superficial burn is a sunburn. That's plain and simple. It's usually red and dry skin, very painful to touch. Every now and then, you may get something like you see here in the picture. It doesn't look very dry, but promise you it is. Um, partial thickness is a little bit different. I want you guys to notice the blisters. It could be... Um, either very thin-walled or thick-walled blisters. The textbook goes into the fact that partial thickness is subdivided into um, superficial partial thickness and deep partial thickness. I don't really care about that. I just care that you know it's partial thickness based on the fact that it's blistering and that it's moist and that it's red. In fact, anytime you see shininess in someone's skin, there is typically either fluid underneath it or a bone underneath it. In this case, we can all see here. Well, let me get a better color so we can all see here. All right. We can actually see that there is fluid underneath that uh, that interstitial space. Uh, we're not going to pop these blisters. We don't do that in the pre-hospital environment because we are essentially creating a vacuum of bacteria to enter into the dermis layer. The uh, blisters actually separate the epidermis from the dermis. So when we decide to take a little needle or whatever we decide to pop this thing with, we're introducing bacteria into the dermis. The epidermis, if you'll remember, is what keeps bacteria away from our internal organs and our environment. So we need to keep this patient as clean as possible. Try to keep them from popping the blisters. This will be something that will be done in the clinical setting under a more controlled conditions. Full thickness, as you can see, is a lot more dramatic. There's a lot more tissue involved, a lot more damage involved. In fact, at the point of injury, they may not be complaining of nerve of pain, so you may not, they may not feel any pain at the point of injury. The patient's skin may be dry and leathery, and they may complain of peripheral pain rather than central pain. And central pain is generally where the location of the um, of the injury occurs. So right here would be the central location and basically what has happened is the the burn is so deep that it's actually damaged the nerve so they couldn't feel it even if they wanted to 
However, I do want you to appreciate the fact that with partial thickness and full thickness burns, you do have a zone of injury. So just because you have a full thickness burn does not mean that, th that a partial thickness burn or even a superficial burn isn't present. It could be surrounding this tissue. In fact, I'm going to outline it kind of here. I guarantee you the patient's going to feel a lot of pain on this periphery. And that's what it's talking about when it says peripheral pain right here at the very edges. If you guys remember during our blast lecture, we had the primary blast wave, secondary blast wave, and tertiary blast wave. It kind of works the same way. Same thing for partial thickness. We may have the exact area where the partial thickness um, area is burned, and then around it could be superficial. Superficial doesn't have any other uh, peripheral pain. It's just going to be painful at the site since it's right there on the epidermis. Partial thickness, it's in the dermis. and full thickness, it's below the dermis into the subcutaneous tissue. So we can mark that. We can do it superficial is in the epidermis. Partial thickness will be in the dermis. And full thickness will be in the subcutaneous tissue or sub-Q. Uh, we've gone over subcutaneous tissue before. This will also be in the fat and muscle. I also want you to understand too that burn depths may progress in route. I've given you the illustration of the uh, patient that I had that had uh, chemical burns that progressed from superficial to partial thickness within a matter of 30 minutes all over his lower abdomen down into his feet where it started off with skin peeling and ended up with uh, massive blisters covering um, everywhere the chemical had touched. Um, again, blisters indicate a separation of the dermis and the epidermis and that sometimes it's going to be impossible to distinguish between partial versus full thickness burns. So we really don't want to get too, um, um, too focused on distinguishing the difference between the two. Make your best educated opinion on it and base your assessment and your treatment on that. Airway, IV hydration, and body temperature regulation is the focus of emergent care. Again, I can't stress that enough. Airway... I want to put body temperature regulation as number two and then IV hydration. So we'll put one, two, three. Because if we think about it, these patients that are needing some critical care for their burn injuries have lost the ability to maintain their body temperature because their epidermis or their dermis has been completely destroyed. And that was one of the major barriers from the, in, from the external environment. So body temperature regulation. After we notice the depth of the burn, we notice exactly where it's at on the patient's body and how much of that burn injury covers the patient's body. That's what we call the body surface area involved or BSA involved. We have a nice little measurement that we use to calculate and approximate it. In the field, we don't really care about being exact. Exact percentages are completely unnecessary. Let the physicians and PAs and nurse practitioners hammer those out in the clinical environment. We need to get as close as possible but again, it's really not that critical to be exactly precise. Uh, the first rule we go over is the rule of nines. And in the figures you have here, we have the adult and the child uh, figure. And these are demonstrating the rule of nines. And it's all based on the factor of nine, nine percent. So on the adult head, it would be 9%, anterior and posterior. And I'm going to put that A and P, not anatomy and physiology, anterior and posterior. So what that basically means is if someone gets burned in the cheek after they've gotten too close to some sort of a fire or chemical or something, we're going to, we're going to call that a 9% BSA burn because... We could subdivide this out in the 4.5% posterior, 4.5% anterior, but we don't. We're just going to ease it down and just call it 9%. Also, you'll notice it says 18 front, 18 back. That's 18% 18 in the front. That encompasses the chest and the abdomen right there at the iliac crest. We could also subdivide this out as well at the diaphragm and say that this is 9% in the top and 9% in the bottom but we don't so if someone burn in the abdomen we say that it's an 18% BSA however you should go with your local protocols for testing purposes this is going to be the standard what I'm showing you here the 18% this is just something you may see out in the field 
with the 9%. All right. Also notice the arms are 9% and it's showing the anterior view of the arms. However, it is 9% anterior and posterior, so it really doesn't matter. Again, we could subdivide that as 4.5% 4, 4 in the anterior and 4.5% posterior because sometimes patients may only get burned in the back of their arm, not in the front. But we're going to go ahead and classify that as a 9% body surface area. And then we have our legs, which take up just as much mass as our anterior thoracic cavity and our abdominal cavity. So that is why it's considered 18%. And then, guys, no matter how um, talented you think you are, it is 1%. It is always going to be 1%. But this is male than female. Notice here on the child that it's slightly different. Uh, we're going to go over pediatrics at a, in another um in another part of the lesson, but just notice real quick that the head is different. It's 18% versus the 9%. 18% versus the 9%. The chest and the abdomen are the same. The, the arms are the same. The only other difference is the legs. It's 14%. Takes up a little bit less mass than that of the adult. There's also this rule called the rule of palms. What I just went over was the rule of 9. So since we use a factor of 9, it's a it's supposed to be easier to make these distinguishments between 9 and 18%. So we go 9, 18, 27, 36, 45, 54, 63, 72, 81, you know, all that good stuff. That's the rule of 9, and that's the basis of the rule of 9. There's also this thing called the rule of palms. Rule of palms means your hand is literally equal to 1% of BSA. So that means if this, if this mannequin here has been for whatever reason he has been burned in the chest and we'll go ahead and burn him in the chest let's get, let's get him a burn going right here boom he has a burn here your hand will go here 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 there 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 there. It doesn't have to be exact. So we have 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8. So that'd be approximately 8%. That's actually about right. Remember, we just talked about if it separates at the diaphragm, it's about 9%. So that's not too bad. However, the one thing I don't like about the rule of palms is that it only considers your hand, you, the, the EMT, the, the rescuer, versus the patient's body, which is completely disproportionate to each other. My hand is not proportionate to you. It could be completely, it would be a lot smaller in comparison to you, or it could be a lot bigger in comparison to you. So I think a better way of doing this would be to use the patient's hand, and they may not necessarily be in the condition to want to do something like this. So I would prefer to use the rule of nines because we just proved that the rule of nines is every bit as uh, accurate as the rule of palms. And again, I want to stress the importance of the fact that exact percentages are unnecessary. That's for physicians and nurses and nurse practitioners to hammer out. That's not our job. We're supposed to get as close as we can, treat the patient, and get them to an appropriate facility. Slight differences in these percentages will not affect patient care ultimately. So remember when we talked about in the beginning that burns are not just skin deep? That was one of your standards. I want to demonstrate why that's the case. We've only been talking about very surface level stuff. We've only been talking about depth and BSA involvement. Now we're going to get to the cellular environment. We're going to get to the internal environment. What's going on underneath all this burning that's causing the uh, signs and symptoms that we may see from our patient later on. And what we're seeing is a dramatic shift in extracellular fluid. The extracellular fluid, which I'll remind you, is one-third of your total body weight. The rest of your body weight is in your intracellular environment within the cell. We've gone over this many times throughout the semester, but you're going to get to see how this um, how these dynamics play a role in the patient's behavior and what we're going to do to stay on top of their uh, stability. So burns cause a dramatic shift in the extracellular fluid. Interstitial space fluid goes up, which causes edema or swelling. So patients who are injured as the result of a burn 
will start swelling up. That's why we tell you, get their jewelry off of them as soon as possible, because as soon as they start swelling, that jewelry may become a tourniquet, and they may have to get amputated distal to the site. Um, I don't know about you, some of you guys, but I wear a tungsten wedding band, and the only way to um, get that thing off of me is going to be to smash it. There's no diamond cutter out there that's going to be able to cut this stuff, and uh, it's becoming increasingly more prominent and popular in wedding rings, not only in men, but in women as well. Probably not as many women, but I would say men. The intracellular environment is resulting being starved because if we increase the space in our interstitial environment, and that's essentially what we're doing. Remember, this is the tissues. This is tissue. The intravascular network, that's your veins and your arteries. And then your intracellular, that's when oxygen is going in and carbon dioxide is going out. And as long as that exchange is occurring, you are a happy camper. However, when we have swelling in within the interstitial compartment, right there, the fluid contain the the fluid compartment of the intracellular space is no longer happy. In fact, it's not able to get that transfer anymore. And worse off is the vessels are actually going to start leaking. And we've seen this before in um, allergic reactions. Well, it's going to do the exact same thing in burn injuries. So what happens is intravascular fluid decreases, and that's going to affect blood pressure. Eventually, the patient's blood pressure is going to start dropping. The heart rate may be up, and the respiratory rate may be up, but the blood pressure may start to fall. And that's why there's going to be a dramatic fluid shift. It may not be because of hemorrhage. However, here's my caveat to this. If you get on scene of a patient that was recently burned, and they have a low blood pressure, you need to look for other signs, other uh, mechanisms by which they are they have sustained um, injury because they're bleeding out somewhere else. Um, bl blood pressure generally isn't affected until after um, an hour or even a few hours after the initial burn injury. It takes a little bit for this intracellular and this extracellular uh, shift to take place, but that's why we're going to be on top of these patients because if we're not, they're going to deteriorate very quickly. So one of the things that we do is we replace their fluids. Our whole goal is to get fluid back into the intravascular compartment so that it can get into the intracellular compartment, which is ultimately where that oxygen-carbon dioxide exchange is going to take place. And we do this through this thing called the Parkland burn formula. And it's the amount of fluid required in 24 hours in milliliters uh, that equals 4 times the patient's weight in kilograms times percent BSA. Kilograms, if you guys remember, if you weigh 170 pounds, you'll divide that by 2.2, and that gives you your weight in kilograms. And I just did mine, so 170 divided by 2.2, and I'll let you guys figure out the math, even though the answer is going to be in the next slide, if you'll just uh, be patient. Um, when we start going over this, you're going to see just how enormous, how just amazing, a lot, how much fluid we are actually giving the patient. In any other circumstance, we would be flooding the patient's lungs and their body, and they would be swelling. But in this specific circumstance, we're actually going to be hydrating the patient slowly with a lot of fluids. And I want you to keep this in the back of your mind. Your intravascular compartment, that's how much blood you have going through your body, is roughly 70 milliliters per kilogram. 70 milliliters per kilogram. So if you take your weight divided by 2.2, whatever that result is, and multiply it by 70, you get how much, uh, roughly how much um, fluid is circulating with your art within your arteries and veins right now. It's supposed to be typically five to six liters for females and six to seven for males, but what I have seen by and large is that's not the case at all, and this may be completely the opposite um, when you do your own math. But let's take a look at how this works in the body. All right, so let's practice real quick. I weigh 170 pounds, and I've suffered a dramatic partial thickness burn to my anterior chest, abdomen, and left leg. 
you're responding to me way out in the boonies of Hicktown. And it's supposed to be way out in the boonies. All right. Let me. It's supposed to be way. There we go. Way out in the boonies of Hicktown, Tennessee. So you have about a two to three hour transportation time to Vanderbilt Burn Center because that's where I want to go and that's where you better be taking me. They got good care there. I've been there before as a um, doing my clinical rotations. You've established an 18 gauge IV in my left AC because you're an awesome EMT student. You've done this many times before and you have had no complications with the IV. My heart and respiratory rate is respectively elevated. Because I'm in a lot of pain and you're not a paramedic, so you can't give me any narcotics, and that just kind of sucks. And my blood pressure is around 136 over 82. According to our parameters, that's not hypotensive. My blood pressure is not too low. I'm doing fine. So we're good to just kind of glaze over the fact that I should not be bleeding out anywhere else. So what I need you to do is resuscitate me with the amount of fluids you think I'm going to need over a 24-hour period. Please, and I'll be nice about it, right? Um... So let's use our Parkland burn formula. Again, it's the amount of fluid that I'm going to receive in 24 hours in milliliters. So we have 4 times my weight in pounds divided by 2.2. That's the conversion factor to kilograms times my BSA. So it would be 4 times 77 kilograms times, it's supposed to be 36, not 36%, 36. If you got 36%, I would barely be receiving what I need to be receiving. We're not, we, we use the BSA percentage as our guide to say it is actually 36. We just take that percentage sign off. So what, after you do this math and you can either do it in your head, which I cannot do, this is why I'm an EMS and I'm not at it because I was not very successful in my math classes and I have a nice Galaxy S2 here that lets me do every, all my calculations. I got 11,088 milliliters or 11 liters. Now, one of these bags is just one liter. Look how many bags it's going to take to resuscitate me. To give you an idea about how much fluid you are giving me, remember when I said 70 milliliters per kilogram is how much fluid I have floating around in my arteries and my veins, and that makes a lot of sense. Well, if you did the conversion right, so it would be 70 milliliters per kilogram. That's literally 5,390 milliliters, or 5.4 liters if we round it. That's how much fluid I have in my arteries and veins. Yeah, look how much fluid you're giving me. You're giving me 11 liters. You're more than doubling what's supposed to be in my arteries and my veins. Because over time, I'm going to start losing all that fluid in my intravascular compartment. It's going to start leaking out, and I'm going to start swelling. Well, it's got to get back into my intravascular space somehow. So that's why we give a isotonic crystalloid solution, normal saline normal saline in 24 hours I will be getting 11 liters of fluid because that's how much fluid they anticipate I am going to lose now where is it going to go is it going to go to my kidneys is it going to go to my stomach uh, am I going to pee it out what's going to happen to it it's going to go into wherever it can path of least resistance and that is not the path of least resistance the path of least resistance is going to be wherever there is swelling and at the end of this I will show you exactly what that means but first, you have a mission. You don't really get the opportunity to choose to accept this. You're going to do this. I'm going to send this as an email attachment, this little table, and you're going to fill it in. Um, you're going to calculate your burn, your Parkland burn formula based on 9%, 36%, and 63%. So I should see your name, so I'll just put my name here. Remember, last name first, first name last. Whatever the formula is, what I would like to see is you don't have to do your work. You can just give me the final product. So if it was 11 liters, that's great. But I actually kind of want you to put your weight in kilograms on the, like in parentheses. Because some of you guys are a little bit bigger. And when you see this table and you see someone who, for me, it would be 11 liters. For someone else, it could be. 22 liters of fluid you're gonna go whoa what's the difference and usually it's just going to be the fact that they're a little bit bigger so we take that into consideration again you're you'll have all weekend to work on this and just um, 
fill this in and then we're going to discuss this in class and kind of take a good idea about what it's going to take to resuscitate most of us. I guarantee you we don't have enough IV fluids to resuscitate even one of us with just 9% of our body surface area involved. Oh, and you're not done. The other thing you're going to do is some research. You're going to find two pictures of each, a superficial, so that means two superficial burns, two partial thickness burns, and two full thickness burns. Get a little get a little creative on your search engines. Uh, make sure you put the safety filter uh, moderate. We don't want uh, you guys don't really want to see anything um, nude or explicit out there, but there are some really good photos, and I want you to upload them into your squad Dropbox. So that means uh, Bravo Squad will upload theirs into Bravo Squad, and Char Charlie will upload theirs into Charlie Squad's uh, Dropbox. And those have been publicly shared with me, so I'll be able to look at them too over the weekend. Because uh, on Monday when we come back to class, I want you to justify. Uh, and discuss your decisions with not only our your squad but then we'll go over it in class what I found interesting is anytime I do research on these pictures uh, if I type in partial thickness I'll get one picture and then I have to type in full thickness and I see the same pictures on that Google search as well so somebody has either um, interpreted it incorrectly or maybe there's more than one interpretation for a particular picture I think it'd be interesting to actually go over it and see what we all think about um, these burn depths and this BSA as a final piece to this I just kind of want you to look at this picture and appreciate the fact that um, when I told you earlier about where does all of this fluid go that's supposed to be in the intravascular compartment it goes into the interstitial space it's uh, often called by physiologists as the third space this is the third space incredibly dramatic but realize just how important it is to get an airway on the patient we discussed this a little bit um, earlier in this um, lecture about how important it is to get an airway on a patient. Had we not had an airway on this patient, um, we would have lost our opportunity or the patient would have had to been trached. This was in the matter of 48 hours in this picture and a clinical presentation is courtesy of Arivec, um, base number nine, I believe they are out of Lewisburg. Uh, Jerome Lovelady was the um, base clinical lead at the time. Um, again, this is called third spacing. This is when intravascular volume goes into interstitial space. And so interstitial space increases. Again, that's all that soft tissue, and there's, no, there's not a lot of um, translation between um, electrolytes and oxygen and carbon dioxide in the intracellular environment. These are incredibly sick patients. They may not be sick when we get to them, but they will be sick down the road. Um, when I got to do my uh, clinical rotations in the burn unit, we got to see some really bad swelling and some really bad bacterial infections post-burns. In fact, that's the number one reason for uh, post-burn mortality is uh, burn infect or infections post-burn. Then you guys can see why that is. So I just wanted you to guys to appreciate what it's going to take to really resuscitate these patients and realize that it's not a critical effort that we do in the here and the now. It's a critical effort that's part of a team process that will go on for weeks, months, and even years for some patients. As always, I post my resources. Of course, I use your textbook. Um, I used uh, this publication to uh, discuss um, third spacing. If you guys want to know any more information, you can consult your textbook, or you can always email me for more questions. I look forward to seeing you guys. Thanks.